Hello, everyone. Welcome to Computer Science E7. This is Lecture 5, Optics. So last week, we were talking about uh, exposure and metering, how uh, I showed you this very enticing uh, slide. Oh, there it is, uh, of a gray screen. And basically, I, I said that this is how a camera tries to meter a scene. And uh, last semester, uh, while I was giving that same lecture, uh, a student that, uh, that happened to be sitting in the class I'm not sure if he really believed me or if he was just looking for himself, but what he did was he caught a very uh, flattering photo of me trying to, rem trying to decide how to answer a particular question and uh, using an example that I gave about taking a photo of the, uh, the projector with me standing right next to it, um, talking about, um, uh, talking about uh, metering and, uh, and exposure values. And, uh, Basically, uh, as you can see, what I, was, what I was trying to say was that with the very bright projector that, uh, that's emitting this image onto the screen, if you try to take a photo of, the, of that image plus me in it, it's going to be a fairly underexposed image. And the reason for that is because of this gray screen. So the camera is trying to make uh, just sort of this average level of exposure, just this sort of middle gray that exists uh, within it, and uh, that's exactly what happened in this in this photo. It tries to make everything this sort of middle gray, and so as a result, it might have achieved that, but it looks to us to be fairly underexposed, and it's actually worse on this projector than it is um, on on the screen. And so it, the camera then it just tries to make uh, the exposure values so that it, it looks to be this sort of middle gray. And we talked about these different exposure modes or these different camera modes that your camera will have uh, to try to help you. Uh, figure out what exposure values you should use. And so we, we looked at this camera uh, of a, or this photo of a 5D, which uh, has a couple of camera modes uh, where the camera will decide maybe one or two of the exposure values, but you have to do the rest of the work. You have to decide for yourself what the other ones will be. And we talked about uh, uh, shutter speed priority and uh, the perhaps more popular aperture priority where you can define an F number or an aperture that your camera will use, and possibly also the ISO for your camera, and the camera will determine then the shutter speed for you as well. Um, and as, as we saw from this previous image, uh, cameras don't always get the exposure right. So we also talked about exposure compensation as, as a way of telling the camera how to fix the problems of, of its exposure, how we can adjust the exposure to be uh, as we would expect, a little bit brighter or a little bit darker. So we move on from exposure on to talking about uh, optics and lenses and some of, the, some of the, the, the stuff that happens behind the scenes, so to speak, on your camera. Um, and what's interesting about this stuff is that the technology doesn't really change all that much. So whereas the, the camera body is very much like a computer these days, where it's every couple of years they're coming out with new ones that are much faster, have many more features, and are always expanding their speed and their number of megapixels and, and the lineup, basically, the feature set lineup that they have. Uh, the, the lenses that you can buy for these cameras don't really change. They do get better over time, uh, but they, it happens at a much slower pace. So if you're thinking of uh, digital photography as, as an investment of some kind, or rather the equipment for it, then you shouldn't perhaps be placing so much of an emphasis on the, the camera body for that reason, because it, it'll change, the technology will change very quickly. And instead, focus your money on lenses, because a lot of the stuff that, uh, that is out there right now isn't going to change very much in the next few years. Um, so if, you, so if you are going to, so like I said, if you're going to buy this stuff, then, then invest in lenses, because this is also one of the things, this is what focuses the light, and the light is what makes the image on your camera. And so if you don't have uh, very good lenses, then you might uh, suffer. Well, it's not to say that, that inexpensive lenses are necessarily extremely poor. It's just that sometimes that is the case, and sometimes you get what you pay for in terms of these lenses. You can have a little bit more reach, or you can get uh, much larger apertures, so you can get a, a lot more light into your camera. And it really depends on the goal of, of your photography and what you're trying to do. And so uh, what, we have actually already talked about something that's very appropriate and very relevant to the optics lecture today, and that is the f-stop, or the f-number, uh, is very much a, uh, uh, an equation that deals with a number of 
the, uh, the factors that go into some of these lenses. So if you remember, what is the F number? Now pretend like I didn't leave the equation up on the board. So it says F divided by D, but what does that mean? Yeah, the focal length divided by basically the diameter of the aperture. And it's not to say that it's, it's the diameter of the lens necessarily because of the complex uh, ways that the light are, is being manipulated inside of the lens. It could actually be a little bit less than, than the diameter itself. Now, um, one of the things that, um, that's important to realize about lenses is, is that um, this focal length has, well, obviously a very large impact on how your end results will look. But um, what some people don't realize is that not all focal lengths are created the same. And in, in other words, you can buy lenses that have focal length ranges that are completely different than other lenses. And this goes even beyond this concept of, say, 4x optical zoom or 6x optical zoom that these digital camera manufacturers love to put on their compact cameras. Those really go through a range of focal lengths that are somewhat normal, a no very normal range of focal lengths. In other words, you could have a very wide shot by zooming out all the way and then get to a reasonably you know, telescopic or reasonably telephoto view just with that one lens. However, when you get up to the SLR world, lenses don't really work the same way. There's, there are some lenses that do have, that do cover that sort of same range, but there are others that are intended for an entirely different purpose. So you might have a zoom lens, for example, that would focus primarily, uh, that, would, that would have focal length range primarily in sort of the telephoto region. Or you would have some that are primarily in the wide angle region, and then you would have this sort of gap, probably, in your equipment of, of focal length ranges. But also, uh, Lenses are available through uh, for your digital SLR that don't actually zoom at all. They're called prime lenses, and I think we referenced them before. And they're much smaller and much lighter than their zoom counterparts because they're not as complex. They don't have to uh, uh, do as much work, so to speak, in terms of focusing the light and doing a very good job of it through this sort of focal length range that exists. Um, and I hope I've already ranted before about my optical versus digital zoom sort of uh, the problem that I have with that. If you have digital zoom on your camera, disable it. It's completely useless. You're not doing yourself any favors. Just later on, go back and, and crop the photo um, if, you, if you actually want to, to do a digital zoom like that. Now, I've been showing this same sort of diagram for a while now uh, about how, you know, oversimplifying a lens and saying, okay, well, there's basically this glass element that focuses the light onto a single point on the film plane. But as we know, Lenses are actually quite a bit more complicated than this. And in fact, there's many glass elements within them, and, and they're shaped differently. They do different things. And we're not going to really go into how to design a lens or what each of these particular elements do. But it is important to realize that these lenses are complex systems, and they're not that easy uh, for us to, to comment on in a very quantitative way much less perhaps be able to engineer them ourselves. If any of you are optical engineers, then, uh, then you should probably be talking about this instead of me, just because it's, it's, it's very interesting, but it's, it's, it's also um, really, really complex. And, um, and to show you, in fact, I do have one of these uh, really neat videos uh, from this show on the Discovery Channel called How It's Made. And if you've ever seen this show, what they do is they have this sort of silly music on in the background with you know, really, uh, really canned and, and, and sort of funny shots. Uh, but what they do show you is how these things and how various things, and in, in, in this one particular episode, um, it's this, it is lenses. All right, let's see. It, it actually shows you how these are made. So here I'm going to show you how these are made. These television lenses start with a very precise design. A diamond blade slices up a block of specially selected optical glass, while coolant prevents the blade from burning it. The slices then go under a diamond drill, which cuts several puck-sized discs from one glass slice. The operator is careful to keep waste to a minimum. Optical glass costs up to $1,000 per kilogram. During the 
drilling, the optical glass sits on a thinner piece of glass covered with wax. As the wax is melted, the discs are easily pulled away. Next, a device spins one of the discs while a wheel overhead sculpts it into a lens. The operator checks each lens for chips, and this one looks smooth. This tar-like substance is called pitch. The edges of the lenses have been built up with tape to contain the pitch. They completely coat the underside of the lens with it. Several pitch-covered lenses are now in a metal shell. A worker picks up a hot aluminum dome called a blocking body. He presses it onto the pitch-covered lenses and the pitch melts onto it. Dousing it with water causes the pitch to harden, sealing the lenses to the blocking body. The blocking body is now upside down and acting as a holding device, as it oscillates on a spinning grinding shell. The grinding makes the surface of the lenses uniform and smooth. They place a polisher on the lenses. It's lubricated with a very fine abrasive. For about an hour, the polisher oscillates while the block spins. Polishing makes the lenses smooth and transparent. It also gives them an even more curved profile. The lenses have been removed from the block and it's time to cut the diameter down to size. Using a microscope, a technician centers a lens between two brass chucks. A diamond blade at the back cuts the lens as the technician monitors it. He's making sure the diameter and axis of the lens have a common center. Next, they group some lenses on round racks called planets. Their universe is a vacuum chamber. Technician closes the door, and the planets continue their orbit. Inside this vacuum, an electron beam evaporates coating materials. The vapor rises to give the lenses a protective coat. A computer monitors the rate of evaporation and the coating. But there's much more to come. Up next, this process really gets visual as all the pieces of the camera lens come together. The lenses have just spent three hours getting a protective finish. It's time to wipe away any residue and make sure they're perfect. This particular lens is concave. She covers it to protect it while she cleans and inspects the lens with the opposite profile, convex. Then the convex lens goes to another technician who places it in a holding device. He looks into a microscope and adjusts the position of the lens until it's optically centered. He uses wax to keep the lens from shifting in the holding device. They give the lens another cleaning. Each one must be absolutely spotless before they proceed to the next step. Otherwise, 
dust particles could become trapped within the optical system and affect image quality. Now that the surface of the convex lens is immaculate, she dabs optical cement onto the center of it. She gives the other concave lens a little more scrutiny before she cements it onto the convex lens. She applies pressure to spread the cement between the two lenses. Cementing them together means they'll be less likely to shift around in the lens barrel. She checks for dust one more time. Then it's under the microscope for an optical alignment of this double lens. Because the cement isn't yet dry, he can push the top lens around and adjust its position. Next, they prep the barrel that will hold the lenses. The technician traces out lettering using a stylus attached to a sharp tool that engraves information onto the lens barrel. It prints technical details that will tell the photographer just what the lens will do. Things like focal length, the F number, and the size of the aperture opening. These reference points allow the user to pull a picture into focus at the desired magnification. Now they double check the design for this complex optical system and begin to pull all the pieces together. This singlet or single lens goes into the metal barrel first. Other lenses with various curvatures and dimensions follow. She places metal spacers between the lenses to separate them. Proper spacing will prevent aberrations in the image, such as blurring. she covers the barrel with a piece of lint-free plastic because eliminating dust continues to be a necessity. One fleck could ruin this entire assembly. Using tweezers, she coaxes the last lens into the barrel. She installs a retaining ring to hold the stack of lenses down. Then she locks it into place. There's one final inspection. She examines the assembled optical lens from all angles. It takes a total of six weeks to make one of these optical lenses. And in the end, it's picture perfect. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems like a really daunting task. I mean, six weeks for that and also these, these people at How It's Made, they love their puns. They're always picture perfect. Oh, it's so interesting, but then they have to ruin it with, with some humor like that. And I'm sure I make my own puns like that that you guys groan at. But I mean, really, these, they should have professional writers or something. It's just me up here. OK, but anyway, um, as you can see, these, these lenses are, are really complex. It's really quite a thing in order to, to be able to design and to actually make one. And believe it or not, a great number of lenses are still built by hand even today. So even though that video now looks somewhat dated, it's really not all that old. And especially as you go up the food chain in terms of the, of the lenses, in terms of price, then you get more attention to detail and, and, even, uh, and even a higher amount of expense uh, applied to it. And in fact, I do want to show you um, this one thing. Let's see. I hope I have it easily available somewhere here. Um, but Basically, it's this one prime lens that, that Canon made for a limited amount of time. And to just give you an idea um, of, of a general focal length range. So on a typical SLR camera, you would generally find uh, for a typical zoom lens, maybe somewhere between like, uh, you know, maybe 24 millimeters all the way up to maybe 130 millimeters or so. Um, but Canon made a prime lens. Uh, that was 1,200 millimeters, and uh, this was a very, very large lens. As you get up in, in size for these lenses, it gets to be really, really, um, really quite large. 
And um, what happened was that they, um, uh, they, they built this lens and it weighs something like 60 pounds or something crazy like that. Um, and let's see, I have it here. Let's see, I hope I can open this now. Um, but basically, they, uh, they made it custom order only so that uh, people with very deep pockets would be able to order one and then they, then they would build it by hand and they would sell it. And uh, let's, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to open it right now, but uh, they, uh, they stopped selling these temporarily or they stopped selling them just because there was no longer a market for them. And uh, B&H, the large uh, the photo website, uh, picked a few up on the used market. Um, and they're selling now for, guess how much money? 20,000 more. 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 Let's see, it is, I think, 120 or $130,000. So you would have to sell your house and then, and then some to be able to afford this lens that you couldn't realistically put on any tripod because it weighs 60 pounds. It has its own custom case. It has its own custom tripod. And it makes the camera look so tiny and ridiculously small next to it that it just, it just completely, I mean, it just completely obliterates all of these other things in terms of scale. Yes? The lens would be used for, well, if you wanted to, I guess, get really high resolution pictures of your neighbors through your, their window. Um, but more seriously, I think it was used for um, sporting events, specifically like the Olympic Games, where photographers have to be somewhat far away, especially wildlife, uh, wildlife photos, where you really have to get a good amount of distance away from, from the person. And, and I, I saw this on B&H, and I saved it. And um, oh, wait, maybe I can do it here. Oh yes, here it is. Okay, so this is this is the the lens, and and again, I, I this it looks small, but it's this is not a handle for one hand. It is it is a very large device, and you can see the price uh, over here. Oops, zoom down too much. Hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and look at at this great deal that you can lease. You can lease it for only. Four thousand dollars a month. So if, if a number of us um, went moved to cheaper apartments, um, we could put our money together and, and lease this uh, this particular device. Yes. I was just curious about the video, like how representative the labor intensity of making that lens. Like how mm -hmm. is that compared to uh, the XLR lens? I mean, are they all made like that? Uh, so back to the yeah. So back to the video. Um, so I suspect that most inexpensive lenses are now automated to a certain degree so that there's less uh, human interaction in terms of their construction. Um, but uh, I, as far as I know, it's still very much a, a manual process, uh, especially for some of the moderately priced to some of the more expensive lenses, such as this one. This one was most certainly uh, built by hand by, um, by Canon folks, and most likely in, in Japan, in their lens factories there. Um, but I think even Canon, you can find on their website, they, they were very proud of their own lens uh, creation facility. And they have, I think, some videos of, of the inside there that's not exactly the same, but they actually have some, uh, some short videos or even some photos of the insides of it. And, then, and it's, again, it's basically just um, a place where people are doing this by hand. They are, they are actually creating these lenses by hand. Yes. Yes, so um, it's a very good point. So a lens like this would definitely do damage to the body. Um, now, there's a reason that you see on these larger lenses uh, a plate down at the bottom of the lens, even on, on this one. There's a plate on the bottom. And the reason for this is exactly for that reason, that um, once a lens reaches a certain heft, which is about the same weight as the camera, if not more, then you're putting more strain on the, on the mount, on the actual metal part that, that interfaces between the camera body and the lens by mounting the camera to a tripod and putting the lens on top of that. So usually you will see a plate like this to mount the tripod to the lens instead. And then you put the lens on the tripod and then you just attach the camera to the lens and it just hangs there. And it, it's, it's unnerving for a, if, if the first time you do it. But when you realize that because this now is actually the center of gravity for the whole system, 
uh, it actually you realize that it's a lot more stable. So even on a lens like this, which is, it, it is larger, but it's not that heavy really. There's a little place for what's called the tripod collar, this little ring right here. You can purchase it separately and put it on the, on the, on the tripod. And it actually honestly would help even a lens like this because if it's loose enough, what happens is that the, uh, the, the camera has a tendency to fall forward because the weight of the lens will, will pull it down like that. And so um, it's easier not only for you, but also on the tripod to mount the lens, um, to mount the, the camera to the lens rather than the other way around. And so, yeah, this, this camera did have, or this lens rather, I believe came with its own tripod that was capable of supporting the weight, um, but also you would, first, you would almost certainly use, um, uh, uh, attach the, the camera to that lens once you've attached it to the tripod and not the other way around. Otherwise it would topple over and there goes your $120,000 investment as it breaks apart into a million pieces. But I, I think um, some people that use this lens, I'm, I'm not actually 100% sure, but I think they use two tripods. One for the, the, the tr for the lens itself, and then if they needed extra stability, they attached it to the tripod and, and, uh, and, and got extra stability that way. Yes? Oh man. So, so the so cost yes yeah, so cost is a very complex question uh, that involves a number of things. So, um, from the slide that is here, let's see, you'll notice that in this diagram, a couple of the lens elements have different colors attributed to them, and I didn't paste a glossary of them here, but. Um, and I forget now which lens this is even from. This is, I think, from a relatively small, relatively simple lens. Um, but most camera manufacturers have different types of elements that they can put inside. So they might have optical glass, but this optical glass might have, might have some sort of special coating on it to help try to reduce the amount of uh, color dispersion, for example. And so that might be one type of glass, so this green one, for example. Then there's another one uh, that's called aspherical. So rather than being a, a lens that's shaped like this, and rather than it being uh, uh, as if it were a sector from a sphere, you know, if you had a sphere and then you, you know, cut off a slice and you basically use that as a lens, they have aspherical ones where, which are sort of flared out on the side a little bit, so they're, they're not as if they were from a perfect sphere. Usually that costs a little bit more money as well, so that might be this yellow color, for example. And so there's, there are these um, other factors and, and other pieces of technology within the lens that can attribute or that can contribute to its high cost, including some of these um, these uh, these different types of elements like fluorite uh, lenses, uh, fluorite lens elements, for example. I think are a special type of glass that uh, I'm, I'm not too familiar with, other than it has special dispersion color dispersion properties, which is supposed to help you know, reduce the amount of, of color dispersion within it. And so that's, you will typically only find in very expensive glass and usually only one element of it because it is that expensive of, of an element. Um, but even as you get higher up into the, into the um, lens categories, they often will also have additional like electronic components as well. So maybe faster autofocus motors, for example, or the capability to do image stabilization or some other little doodads and, and other technical things that, that can make it a much more expensive thing. And so um, it's, it's very subjective to say which uh, camera manufacturer has the best lenses between say Canon and Nikon. I think the general consensus online uh, from people that, are, that talk about lenses and, and the technical details behind them is that um, for the longest time, Canon had uh, the upper edge in the longer lenses, so in the very telephoto lenses. And so this, these white lenses, for example, uh, are actually very popular, especially in uh, the Olympic Games, which, let's see, do I even, I hope I have that photo now. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't have access to it right now, but I, I think I, I might have shown you this photo once of, of basically the, the sidelines of an Olympic game. And it was basically a whole bunch of photographers and it was just, it was just 
white lens after white lens after white lens. And, and for the longest time, those white lenses were attributed to Canon. Like those were the, those were the Canon lenses to have. And Nikon um, right now has sort of the upper edge in wide angle lenses um, and in especially the, the um, not the lower end lenses necessarily, but the li less expensive glass uh, Nikon will typically have better quality than, than the Canon side. So Canon is, is good if you really want to spend a lot of money um, um, on telephoto lenses, but Nikon might be better if you want the, the best quality wide angle lens. But really, when you get down to it, it's, it's, it really doesn't matter that much. They're both very, very high quality, and you will get very good uh, lenses even out of both of them. And in fact, um, you wouldn't know it, but this lens is, is 16 years old. It was built in 1993. It has an autofocus and it works just like, I mean, I, I bought this used, but it works just like the day that it, that it was bought because it, it, it autofocuses quickly and it has some very, very good um, optical qualities to it. And so that just, it just brings back this idea that I was talking about before of, of purchasing high quality glass and you will be able to use it somewhat as an investment and you can keep using it throughout time. Yes? Is it valued significantly or will you still be able to sell it? Um, has it devalued significantly? So I didn't, I actually haven't, I didn't buy it that long ago, honestly. Um, and by now, it, I think lenses only really devalue when newer versions of the same lens comes out. Um, then, the, then the older models get sort of bumped down to a lower tier in cost. So until another lens like this um, is released, then that, that'll be sort of the next depreciation hit. Um, but for the most part, lenses that are in good condition and are used, they retain most of their value. There's, there's a little bit of a hit initially. As soon as you buy it, there's, I mean, as with most things, there's a little bit of a hit. But then it sort of retains that value as long as you keep it in reasonably good condition throughout the time that you own it, unless it, for some reason it, there's just, it's, there's something really wrong with it or, you know, something abnormal with that lens or, or with that particular series of lenses. Okay, but before we go into full-blown Q&A mode, I do actually have a number of things to talk about uh, as it relates to this optic lecture. So I was talking before about focal length, um, and one of the things that focal length does is not only magnification, but also it, it um, it helps change, now this is, this is tricky to say properly. Um, focal length gives us the perception of perspective. And what I mean by that is that if you use a very wide angle lens, for example, and get very close to a subject. Now, if you imagine a wide angle lens, that means you're getting a lot of the scene, excuse me, into, into that one image. And then you get very close to a particular person or object then what you are doing is getting, is you're, per, you're sort of distorting the edges. You're changing the perspective of that person. And in fact, using a wide angle lens is, actually, is a very popular way of sort of distorting people or distorting, uh, especially um, photos of, of dogs. People love to take really wide angles and get really close to them so their noses look huge and their, you know, their rear end looks really small comparatively. It, it makes them look sort of uh, have different proportions, but that's what um, these wide angle lenses can do is that um, you are altering the perspective by allowing with a wide angle lens, allowing you to get closer to a subject and therefore get more of that uh, subject from that distance within it. Now, on a 35 millimeter film camera or even a, a, a digital SLR, which is which are typically about um, you know 35 millimeters in size in terms of the, the sensor size, um, a 50 millimeter lens is considered a normal lens. And um, what that means is that it's, it just has a normal perspective. There's nothing um, distorted about it. There's, there's, it's not abnormally uh, focused in or rather zoomed in, for example. And you get this as an example, this photo on the left side of, of my brother, just sort of a normal average uh, uh, focal length, uh, a normal um, uh, amount of of uh, view, angle of view from that particular image. And if you put a 50 millimeter lens on your SLR camera, uh, on most SLRs, as you look through, if you open your left eye and you look through the camera with your right eye, it actually looks to be sort of the same. It looks like you're looking through the same thing versus putting on a ridiculous lens like this, for example, it's obvious that you are way zoomed in on one lens 
versus the other. Now, um, on the right, uh, this actually is, is much less of a focal length. It's 16 millimeters. And, and as I said, remember, when you have a lower focal length, you have a wider angle, so you can get more of, of something in the photo. Now, perspective is actually a, a tricky thing. And I'm going to have to spend a little bit of time talking about it. But it's only tricky in the sense that the way you consider a, um, the way the relationship that most of you probably have in your mind between focal length and perspective is actually somewhat different than what how you should be thinking of it if that makes sense so in other words yes I'm telling you that you are you are doing it wrong or you're thinking of it incorrectly so to say that um, focal length has a direct correlation with perspective isn't correct strictly speaking now what is correct is the, your change in distance to a subject. That is what is going to change the perspective of it. And so um, when, you are, uh, when you are taking a photo, so for example, this photo on the upper left-hand corner. So just to give you an example, there's, there's four photos here. We're going to go through them one at a time. And they start in the upper left-hand corner. This is one. This is two, upper right-hand corner, three, and four. So this first one in the upper left-hand corner, this is just a, a photo um, taken with a 33-millimeter uh, a lens. So it's not super wide. It's just sort of a wide-angle lens uh, of, a of a table and a salt and pe pepper shaker. So you can just get an idea of, of what we're dealing with with this image number one. That's all we're looking at right now. Now, let's say that we took um, a crop. So we, we brought this image number one into Photoshop, for example, and actually cropped the image out. And we specifically cropped the area in the red box right here. And then we blew it up and made it the same size as image one. OK, so we basically just cropped and, and resized to make it the same size. We then get this image number two. And, and, if you take, and if you just note the way that the salt and pepper shakers look in this image, you notice that. Um, it doesn't really look all that different. It just, it's obviously, we just cut it out of that image. We cut the center out and zoomed in, and then that's what we see. Now, let's say that we take this 33 millimeter lens off of our camera and replace it with an 80 millimeter lens. OK, so we've taken off this wide angle lens, and we've put a longer lens on it, and we take a photo again. Now, the result of that is image number three. Now, I'm going to ask you to try to compare the way image two and image three look. And if you look very closely, I mean, there's some minor differences like, like the color and, and that sort of stuff. But that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about the perspective here. And you'll notice that the perspective appears to be the same from both. And this is exactly what I was telling you before, where you may have this perception in your mind that a wider angle changes your 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 view of perspective within the, the scene. But that's not really what's happening, is that as you use a longer lens or as you zoom in, you're not changing your perspective. You're just taking a, a smaller and smaller portion of that scene and basically blowing it up, so to speak. You're basically magnifying the center of that scene different amounts. So the higher your focal length, the more you're magnifying, if that makes sense. So you can think of it almost like a, a telescope, or, or you know, like uh, very much like uh, we use the word wide angle and telephoto. That's sort of where you can think of this. This is coming from. Now, let's say that we removed that 80 millimeter lens, we put that 33 millimeter lens back on the camera, and we moved the camera forward, all the way very close to the salt and pepper shaker. Then we took another photo. And that is this photo. Now, this is probably what you were thinking of when we're talking about using a wide-angle lens to distort the perspective. And that's precisely what's happening, is that because you are now closer to these objects, your perspective of them has changed. And so by using a wide-angle lens, even though we have sort of the same amount within the frame, because our perspective of it has changed, it looks, it alters its appearance. It looks different. It looks more exaggerated, for example. So using a longer lens will actually compress its perspective, as you can see here, using a wider angle lens. And if you get closer to it, will actually make it look farther. 
Now, those of you that, those of you that are familiar with video might actually be familiar with um, what's called the Hitchcock effect, or I think it might also have another name of, of the Dolly effect. And what this is, um, is this idea of, of people using um, a zoom lens. And let's say you are relatively close to a subject, or, or relatively far, but we're just going to use close for, for an example, and have a certain amount within the frame visible in your viewfinder. Then, as you zoom in to that subject, you take steps back. And you're doing this at the sort of same speed, so that as you step back, you are zooming in at the same rate, if that makes sense, so that as you, as you move back, you are compressing the perspective. You are making the background become flatter against the subject uh, that you are trying to take a photo of. And this was uh, popularized, I believe, by um, Alfred Hitchcock. And that's why they call it the, um, the Hitchcock effect. But if we take a look at this video that I have of, uh, of a movie called Goodfellas, if you've seen it, um, they actually do this exact thing. So if, pay attention very closely to the background as, they're, as these guys are talking in the scene. And you'll notice that very slowly, it seems to be changing the way that it looks. Oops, where'd it go? All right. OK, it closed. Hold on. Let me try this one more time. OK, so here, and just to show you an example, so this is before. So if you take a look, the background looks fairly well separated from the foreground. The, the perspective is, is not very compressed. We have very wide range, uh, this, this great sort of depth that exists here in this perspective. But if I go near to the end, you can see the difference in perspective. So that's the end where now the background looks very, very close. So the perspective has been compressed versus the very beginning where it's separated. And by doing it quickly, you can see that we retain approximately the same amount of, of, foreground, sub, of foreground objects in the, 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 uh, the image, but we are just changing the perspective by moving and by zooming in at the same time. Now, this compressed perspective can actually lead to some pretty neat things. And um, I'm going to show you um, this photo that actually uh, that I took um, this summer in my hometown of, of El Paso, Texas. And it's not that impressive of a photo. It, it just, it, there's a lot of stuff in it, as you can see. Um, but when I took this photo, and, now, and, and knowing where some of these locations are in El Paso, I realized that this would actually be a great way to demonstrate to you how compressed of a perspective this is. So to give you an idea, I used a very long lens. I used the 420 millimeter lens on my camera. Uh, and was perched basically atop a mountain and uh, took photos down the sort of main street called Mesa Street that's visible here. And um, if we take a look, so I just want to show you now on Google Earth sort of the distance that's covered between, um, between the foreground and the background subjects. All right, let's see. Um, I have here on Google Earth. So this pin right here, that's where I took the photo. I was sort of at the bottom of this almost cul-de-sac area, and I was taking a photo in, in this sort of general north northwest, or rather uh, west northwest direction. So if I zoom out and zoom out and zoom out and zoom out, all right. So this is going to take a little while. Let's say I'll do this more quickly. All right. So now we are at basically the block level, and now you you'll notice that there are a few houses over here, and in fact, it's these houses that you notice at the bottom of this particular image. So the, the roofs here, those are those houses about a block away. OK, all right, yeah, I'm hearing some wows, but, but save them, because this is about to get um, a lot more mind blowing. Oh, all right, so these houses right here at the bottom. All right, including one with a nice little um, sunroof of some kind. OK, so going back here. Now, I want to show you, as I zoom out, um, this down here, this is the beginning of, of Mesa. Now, uh, hold on. i got to go up a little bit. All right, so if we take a look here, you'll notice that we see U-Haul uh, and Arby's, discount tire, that, that sort of thing. 
OK, now I have to actually try to find this over here. That is, uh, oh, oh no, too far. OK, that's the high school. That is over in this area. So Arby's is right here. Uh, this is, uh, the U-Haul is right around here somewhere. And just to give you a reference, I'm going to zoom out again so you can see the, where's my, all right, so there's my, my uh, where I took the photo there. Uh, is there a scale on here? Well, we can, I'll show you a scale later. But basically, you'll notice that there is an, a region where, the, where Mesa goes uphill. And in this area right here, this is actually my high school. And you can see that in the photo over here. That's where this region is here. OK, so I'm just, I'm just going to keep it at this zoom level, and we'll keep going west, basically. Now you see, if you look a little bit farther, all right, so there's a Circle K, Golden Corral over here. We see uh, there's a, a bridge up here. Now this bridge right here, this is uh, I-10. It's the major highway that goes through western El Paso. So I'm going to keep going west here. Um, this is I-10 right here. The uh, Golden Corral was right over here. All right, so just to keep going. Oh, where's my image? So now you can see that it gets sort of green. And this is what's called the valley, uh, because El Paso is very mountainous. And this is the valley region. Now if we, you see that it's very long and straight before a left turn over here. And I don't know if you can see it, but right here, there's a, there's a Circle K. Very, very far gas station. So all right, let's see if we can find that. So we keep going. You notice it starts getting green here. Still going straight. Here is the turn. And the Circle K is approximately here. Now, if you, if you were to load this on your own computers and actually do a, well, I can do a distance check myself from here. But you'll notice that it is an extremely long distance from where I took the photo. And this is just a really extreme example of where, of how much we can compress, um, how much we can compress the perspective. OK, so I'm going to use the ruler and take it from, now, let's see, where was that? So this was I-10. I'll take it from about here. And we'll measure how far of a distance it was. Oh, no. Oh, come on. Why is this so hard? All right, here we go. So in, in terms of straight distance from the, the very bottom of the photograph, which were houses right over here, to the very end, that part of the Circle K is about five and a half to six miles. So you can get a huge range of perspective or a huge compression of perspective when you are actually using a very, very long telephoto. Now, if you were to ever visit El Paso um, and drive down Mesa, you would actually have uh, quite a long journey. It would take you quite a long while down there. And then I think you would truly begin to appreciate be beyond what I can show you on Google Earth um, how much this actually compresses the perspective. Now on the other end of, of the focal length range is this idea of wide angle. So we can use wide angle to really alter, um, oh come on, to really alter how, uh, how different something can look. So whereas we can really compress the perspective with a long focal length, we can, oh, Boy, I can't advance in slides. I am just having so many tech problems right now. Oh, here we go. OK. Oh, it shows on this screen, but not on this screen. OK, so I will talk about it as if it were up on the screen. But basically, you will see two images. On the left, oh, God. <laughs> Please hold. Take, um, almost. I, I'm almost to a, to a break point. OK, so now we're good. OK, so here. We see two images. On the left, um, there's, there's an image of a laptop. And on the right, there's an image of a room. And these are both the, the sort of images that you would expect to see with very wide angle images. Because you would then get a lot of an image in, or a lot of something in, on your, uh, on your scene. And usually, you can use that to exaggerate lines, if you want to exaggerate a lot of lines in your uh, particular image. So for example, uh, to exaggerate the lines within this room, or to exaggerate the, even the size of the room, for example, you would use a wide angle lens. And now, um, one of the things to watch out for, though, is the distortion that 
happens when you are taking a photo with a wide angle lens. So as you can see, this, this does look somewhat distorted. Well, I can tell you that the laptop is actually square at the corner. It's not sort of angled at all like this. But, um, and the same thing will happen if you take a photo of a person with a wide angle lens. You can distort their faces and make them look a little silly and they may not like that very much. Like my sister right now is, is, is actually texting me like crazy because she doesn't know that I'm in class and, and so she would be really bothered right now if she knew that I had this picture up of her, uh, even though this picture is now, um, is now five years old of her. But using wide angle lenses, you have to be very, very careful with lines. You have to try to make lines perpendicular. So in other words, um, by taking this photo, I had to take this photo with the camera pretty much level to the ground. If it was at an angle, then the, the lines wouldn't look so straight in the back. They would sort of diverge or converge in some way, and, and it just wouldn't look natural, very much like is happening over here. So you have to be very careful with um, the perspective on a wide angle lens and be sure that you are able to get all of these lines perfectly straight and to try to get them to be at 90 degree angles. It's, it's very much a, uh, a fun exercise um, for you to have to do. Okay, so let's take a five minute break. When we come back, we'll continue talking about optics. Hello everyone, welcome back. So hopefully this half will uh, be a little bit less crazy and, and it'll, hopefully I will look less like I don't know what I am doing. Okay, so what we were talking about before was uh, this idea of having perspective changes that can result with you getting much closer to something and using a very wide angle lens and the sort of result, the sort of distortion effects that you can get by using a wide angle lens um, and, and, uh, and how you can try to correct it by trying to square up basically your lens with all of the angles that exist in the room. Um, but there, there is a different way that you can use, that you can solve this problem as, as well. And as with most things, you can solve it by spending money. And uh, if, you, if you decide to spend money to correct this, this sort of perspective change that can exist, one of the things you will want to investigate is, is using or purchasing a tilt shift lens. And so I have to mention right now that these are very expensive lenses, but they can be used to correct perspective changes. And also, like with most things in photography, we can also try to adjust things in uh, Photoshop or to use software to try to correct some of these geometric distortions that can happen as a result. However, as with most things, software, that takes a little bit of time, it takes a little bit of knowledge, and it can be perhaps a little bit prohibitive. So again, you can either spend time or you can spend money uh, to try to solve these issues. Now, um, talking about lenses, uh, if you remember from that video, they said that there's this, this one guy that works at this lens factory and he very painstakingly basically writes the, the data that uh, exists on the side of a lens barrel using this sort of reducer, this, uh, this, this uh, uh, this template and reducer mechanism that, that they seem to have, which is pretty neat. But luckily, at least for many of the modern lenses, we now see that they're printed on. So this poor guy is unfortunately perhaps out of a job, but it also means that this happens a lot more quickly and is a lot less error prone. But one of the things that the video did say is still relevant to us, and that is the data that's imprinted on the side. Usually we will see some sort of focal length indicating the magnification level or the zoom level of this particular lens. And also we will see the F number. And so I suspect that um, they were trying to, to make a, a list of three items out of two and they, and they actually mentioned two different things, the, the F number and also the size of the aperture, which I guess you could denote from the, uh, from the F number, but that's really not the case all the time. Perhaps what they were talking about was in fact this other thing called a filter size. And so with most lenses, what you get on the front um, when you actually purchase a lens is a lens cap of some kind. And usually if you take off that lens cap and you look at the inside ring, you'll notice that it's actually threaded like a very large screw. And you can put a number of filters on the front of that lens uh, to modify its behavior in some way. And we'll talk about filters in, at the end of this lecture. Um, but the, the size of that thread is denoted on the lens by the filter size. And you'll notice that we have another symbol here 
that you will unfortunately have to remember, but it is very similar to something else that we've seen before, that vertical line with the circle, uh, which denotes the film plane. But in this case, it's a sort of slanted line. It's more like a null symbol. It's a slanted line with the circle that indicates filter size. And so in this case, we can see that if we purchased a 67 millimeter filter, it would work on this lens. We could screw it on the front and it would work on this lens. And so um, most lenses, even the ones on compact digital cameras and even the ones on some uh, uh, camera phones, you will find the same sort of data uh, printed on the, the lens barrel in some form or, in, or another or in some location or another. And so you'll, you'll generally see something like this. So in this case, these are just, uh, these two are Canon lenses that are just used as, as representative examples. And the one in the upper left hand corner is a Pentax lens, but it tells us quite a bit about the lens itself. So as we talked about the focal length. So in, in each of these cases, uh, they're all zoom lenses because we see a focal length range. So we see the minimum focal length that they're capable of through a mo maximum focal length that they're capable of. Uh, and we also see the maximum F number that these uh, lenses are capable of. So basically the largest diameter at which the aperture is possible uh, to, to be placed at. And we can see that on this lens, it's an F4. This lens here, it's also in F4. You see it says one colon four. Usually you'll see it's a couple of different ways, but it's all represented, uh, it's represented different ways, but means the same thing. Uh, and over here we have a one colon 3.5 to 5.6. Now each of these things tells us different numbers for the F number. And, and it's important to remember that this is the maximum size of the aperture, which means it's the lowest F number these lenses are capable of. However, there's something funny going on with these two lenses in particular. And so if we focus on this one for a moment, you see that in parentheses it has the number 22, which probably means, and this is, I think this is pretty rare in lenses nowadays, but I think it means the maximum F number that you can use for this particular lens. So you, you have a range, basically an F number range of F4 all the way to F22 on this particular lens. Now the one on the right is some, somewhat different. You see that it says it has an F number range of 3.5 to 5.6. Now keep in mind that this doesn't mean, the 5.6 doesn't mean that that's the smallest the aperture can be or the highest F number. Instead, what this is telling you is the maximum F number range through, through the, the zoom range that it's capable of. So at 18 millimeters, at, this, at the smallest uh, focal length, it has a maximum F number of 3.5. But as you zoom in with this lens and you get to 55 millimeters, the maximum F number at that focal length is 5.6. And so as you zoom in, it's, it sort of varies. It increases as you zoom in uh, from 3.5 to 5.6. But this lens then is actually relatively slow. If, it's, if the maximum aperture is at the, at the most telephoto range, is 5.6, then that's, I mean, you, you have several stops available to you, especially when you compare it to, say, this 50 millimeter prime, which is capable of f1.8, has, has an f number of 1.8 on it. And in fact, this is that lens that I'm always recommending. If you're a first time SLR buyer, you don't want, to, want, don't want to splurge on very expensive lenses, that's usually a good first one to go with because it has very wide aperture. It has a very low f number for, for the price and for the weight and for um, for a variety of things, for its size as well. Now, um, typically, you will, well, typically you will see a lens that's like this, especially when the lenses are, are more inexpensive. You will see a range of F numbers that, uh, or the maximum F number varies from, from within the zoom range. But uh, as you get uh, into the more expensive lenses, you will sometimes see that the, F, the maximum aperture actually stabilizes. It, it remains the same throughout its zoom range. And, and theoretically speaking, and, and talking about this, and you know, if money were no object, that's generally what you want, is you want an F number that's going to remain the same, because then that way, um, it, it doesn't actually alter um, your exposure calculations as you change zoom ranges. And it also doesn't affect the brightness of the viewfinder. And now, uh, one of the things that will actually happen when you put a lens on the camera, uh, when you look through its viewfinders, you're actually seeing the, the image that your camera is going to take. You're, at, you're literally seeing the image through that particular lens. 
So if you have a lens that has a larger aperture, it's going to be brighter because it's going to allow more light in and it's going to that therefore allow more light through the, the viewfinder and to your eyes. So therefore, a, a lens that has a lower F number, well, a, a bigger maximum aperture, and it's the same thing, remember, um, is going to be better for you in terms of usability because you'll be able to see things more clearly. Things will be brighter through the viewfinder. And if you don't believe me, take, for example, this lens here and then take another lens, like say this one, zoom it in all the way to about, uh, to about 55 millimeters, and if you take one off and put the other one on, it will be noticeably brighter or, no or noticeably darker depending on which one you put on the camera. So it's, it's also a usability thing for you as well, how easily you will be able to take um, a particular image. Now, um, keep in mind that as you get to be, uh, as you purchase lenses that have lower F numbers, so maximum apertures, higher maximum apertures, then you're going to be spending a lot more money and you're also going to have a lot heavier of a lens because every time you double the area here, that means you're putting a lot more glass and this glass is really heavy uh, and really expensive into one of these lenses. And so uh, even when you get up to the higher range lenses, you're going to have to make a decision between uh, weight and uh, cost and how much light you want available to you and to your camera. And in fact, if, if I can keep talking about this stuff, your camera is only capable of autofocus within certain maximum aperture ranges. So if you put a lens that's on your camera, and a typical SLR camera cannot autofocus once you have a lens that's any darker than 5.6, and about an F number of about 5.6. So once you get to a lens that's F8 or F11 or anything above F5.6, your camera loses the ability to autofocus because it's simply too dark for it to be able to perform its autofocus calculations. Now the only exception to that is of course when you get to the really expensive cameras. Then you are able to, per then you are able to use lenses that are maybe about f8 or so, but even then you're not going to be able to go much darker than that. Now realize that I don't want you to get confused between setting the f number up here and your camera's ability to autofocus. So if you set the F number to something like F11 or F16, your camera is still able to autofocus. The reason is that the aperture is inside the lens is always open at its maximum capability. So when, when you're looking through the viewfinder, and when the camera is taking its exposure calculations and focusing, it keeps the aperture as large as it possibly can to let in as much light as it possibly can. Then when you set the F number on your camera and you take the photo, very quickly does it stop it down to the proper size. And if you remember when I passed around the camera, you push that button. That's exactly what it does. It stops it down, takes the photo, and then opens it back up again. So just because you set an F number higher than F8 or F11, it doesn't mean that your camera is suddenly going to not be able to autofocus. It's, a, it's an actual physical limitation of the lens that's going to prevent it from autofocusing. Okay, now as you can gather, changing this, the length or uh, changing the focal length will actually alter the size of the uh, the lens itself. And as 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 I showed you in that one particular uh, image of that you know that monster uh, 1200 millimeter lens from that B and H ad, that is a really huge lens. That is you know it's 12 it has a focal length of 1200 millimeters. And it's very much, there's very much a correlation between increasing the focal length of a lens and its size. So as you get, as you increase the focal length, you will generally have uh, an increase in size as well. So just to give you an example between some of these differences, so um, from left to right on this list of, um, of, of uh, lenses that I have here, we have a 24 to 70 zoom uh, with maximum aperture of f2.8. Then we have a 70 to 200 f4, then a 70 to 200 2.8. And so you can really tell the difference. Now, it's, yes, it's a little bit longer. It doesn't mean the focal length has changed. But the, what's more important is the, is the bulk, how much wider this lens actually is. And it's actually considerably heavier. It's, I don't know if it's twice the weight, but it's, it's probably about uh, one and a half to two pounds heavier for this lens on the right. And, and I can guarantee that if you're walking around with this lens, um, you're not going to want to um, 
uh, carry around such a heavy lens all the time. Just to give you a comparison, this is a 70 to 200 f4, but it's an IS version, so it's somewhere, it's just slightly larger than this one, perhaps, but it's definitely not as big as this. Okay, so moving on, on this side, uh, we have, let's see, a 70 to 200, so we have this lens, the 70 to 200 f2.8 right here, and then next to it, this behemoth of a lens is a 500 millimeter f4. So you can see that as you get larger in these lenses, you're going to have to um, you know, break your back to carry them. And, and one of the things you'll notice is that these larger lenses, not only do they have these plates for you to put the, to attach them to the tripod directly, but also they have their own straps so that you, you, you carry this, this camera with, your, with the, basically your, the lens attached to your neck, strapped around your neck, and the camera is just dangling around the back. And to give you a more real life comparison, this, this lens that I was talking about before is a 300 millimeter prime f4. So this lens is only, it's not capable of any zoom or anything like that. Um, but if you really want to impress your friends, it actually has a, a built in lens hood that you can extend. And they say, wow, that's a really big lens. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> it is. Okay, but anyway, beyond that, you can see the lens hood for this uh, 500 millimeter lens sitting right next to it. It's, it's um, very, very large. And as you know, the lens hood is used to protect uh, uh, flare from, uh, from these lenses. And um, one of the things you might notice about uh, these lenses in particular that, is that most of them have these red rings around them. Um, this is Canon specific, and it indicates uh, their L line of lenses, which is their, their upper end, their higher range of lenses. And, and usually means that it, it's automatically going to be very, very expensive, and it's automatically going to be, um, well, there's going to be a lot of snobs online, especially if you look online, there's a lot of snobs that say you have to buy L glass because that's the only thing you can do. It's not necessarily true, I don't think. I think you can get very high quality lenses out of some of the less, the, the less expensive lenses that exist. But once you reach a certain point, a certain focal length, you usually have no choice other than to purchase these, uh, these more expensive, um, these more expensive lenses. Now, one of the things that uh, this red ring does do for you um, is that it does mean that it's it's Canon's higher end of equipment. And Nikon has a similar thing. Um, I don't think it's a ring per se, but I think they have a, a I think it's called a G type or something. I, I don't really know Nikon's range very well, but basically they have some way of of telling you that you are getting perhaps a couple of features that are better than their lower cost brothers. And in particular, you are getting higher autofocus speed, for example. So you will be able to focus much more quickly or, you, or higher build quality, or even what many of these are capable of um, is a form of weather sealing. So that if you have a weather sealed body, you can actually use it in, in all but you know, the worst weather, uh, including rain and, and snow and all sorts of stuff and, and be able to use it safely. And, and I found that, uh, in my experience, that most of these lenses are capable of a little bit of a little bit of drizzle, a little bit of rain, and, and I'm not even talking about the the L lenses. I'm talking about even just the regular lenses that you can get. They're they're very they're pretty well built, unless they're you know the absolute cheapest you can get. They can handle a little bit of abuse, um, but these the L lenses. Uh, there's a number of them that are weather sealed and can do some of this stuff a bit better than um, than um, than just the normal. Uh, less expensive lenses. Okay, now in terms of taking the raw photos, um, having a fast lens is good. And a fast lens, remember, means that you have an F number that is very, very low. And so if you have a lens that is, that is fast, then you're able to open up its aperture a lot and you're able to get not only a lot of background blur, but you can also get a lot of shutter speed. You can get a very, very fast shutter speed. So you are given more options by having a faster lens, but um, of course the downside then is, is not only the expense, but also the weight. And so you have to make this trade-off between what you want uh, to spend and how much you actually want to carry in your kit. Now, uh, when we're using these fast lenses, we do have quite a bit of background blur um, behind the subjects. And I really just did a lot of hand waving before and, and glossed over it and, and just told you that that was true, but now we get to talk about why that actually happens. And so what causes this background blur? And so no, it's not this chip, but I'm using this chip just as a, as a representative 
Um, this is basically just a sensor. So if we think about a digital sensor, we know something about it. We know that it captures light, and we know that it captures light onto pixels. So usually we have this concept of megapixels, and there are, people are always saying more megapixels is better, um, et cetera. But luckily, as hopefully, I, I, hopefully you remember, I said that's not necessarily true. But these pixels on a sensor have a fixed size. They're only so large, and so that means that they're only able to capture a certain amount of detail or a certain amount of light. And so there's going to be another diagram up here that I don't want you to get confused immediately by, immediately by. Let me explain it for a little bit, and hopefully it will make a little bit more sense. Now, let's say that we have a, a lens. So we have this lens right here. It's oversimplified, of course, and we have this light that enters the lens from the upper right hand corner. And so this lens, of course, focuses the light and it will ideally focus it onto our sensor. And so what we've been talking about before with a lot of the diagrams that I've shown before is that the, the lens will actually focus the light onto one exact tiny, tiny little point. And that will show up as, as a dot, basically, as a, as a little, if you imagine, uh, for example, stars. If you take a photo of, of a star field, each little star is a little bit of a, is a little dot, and all of this light has to converge onto a dot on the sensor for it to appear that way. Now that's sort of what's going on here. We have this, this light that's coming from very, very far away. We have to focus it onto this dot. But the pixels on the sensor itself aren't infinitely small. They do have, even though they're very tiny, they do have a certain amount of width and they do have a certain amount of height. So that means that there is a range of a loud sharpness, basically, that this lens can focus on. So if we, if we have this concept right here, so let's say this, that we have a, a circular pixel, and um, we give it a certain size. Now, any, any amount of light that's focused that's smaller than that, it will still appear as a dot. It's not going to be any sharper in the end image if it's any more focused than this, for example. So we have this range of a loud sharpness that can exist within an image. And so I've, I've marked here something called the COC, or what's called the circle of confusion. I really wish whoever came up with that didn't call it that, because I think it just helps make it more confusing. But you can think of, of this circle of confusion as being sort of the smallest little tiny pixel, so to speak, that is allowed for us to make something sharp. So it's not exactly one pixel, but it's, it's, it's actually some, it's, it's a bit more complex. It involves uh, um, you know, how we actually view the end result. So if, if we are very, very zoomed in on an image, for example, when we're looking at it on our computer screen, then as you know, things can look a little bit blurrier than if we are not as zoomed, at, not as zoomed in on that particular image on our computer screen. That's one factor that we have to take into account. But we can generalize this and just say that there is this, this one little circle, this one little bit of area, and if that lens focuses the light onto that area or smaller, anything that's that area or smaller, it will appear to be sharp. It will appear to be in focus. Because if that light goes over to the next pixel, for example, then it's occupying two pixels. It's not going to be exactly sharp. It's not going to be exactly one dot on the image. It will appear, appear to be slightly blurry, for example. And so then we have this range through which something can be acceptably in focus as, as it becomes focused uh, by the lens and onto the sensor. Now, um, we're talking about very, very small um, amounts for the circle of confusion. So for a typical digital SLR nowadays, we're probably talking about a circle of confusion diameter that's about 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 millimeters. So very, very, very small. And so anything, um, any light that's, that focuses on, you know, basically, basically focuses larger than that, it's going to be blurry. And we are going to see this background blur. And so that's where this depth of field comes from. So anything that is larger than that, um, and so remember that the, the, this is meant to, uh, to show you not exactly where the sensor is going to be necessarily, but just as this lens focuses the light, there is a range uh, through which that light will appear to be in focus. So if our sensor was anywhere within this region right here, 
then it will appear to be in focus. But if it's outside that region, so maybe back here, for example, or over here, then that dot is not going to be in focus. And that's all that this range is telling us. So to look at it now, um, in terms of aperture, in terms of the F number, let's say that we have a very, very large aperture and we have light that's coming in from the very outermost extremes of the lens. And as it goes through this aperture, and remember that the aperture isn't necessarily the front element, it's not the very front piece of glass, it could be something inside that, that's actually limiting the aperture. As it goes through that aperture, you can see that if we have a particular circle of confusion, uh, we have this depth of focus here. Now if we stop down the aperture so that we make it, we basically make the, the, the light narrower, then it's going to be a lot longer. So when we bend this light, it's going to be a lot longer like this, and we therefore have a wider range through which our subjects can be in focus. So again, for this top aperture, our sensor could be anywhere along here and be in focus. But for our bottom one, it could be anywhere along this range, which means that something over here, if our sensor is over here, then that object will still be in focus. Whereas if we had it with this larger aperture, it would not be in focus anymore. And in fact, um, if you've ever taken a photo with your digital camera, with your digital SLR, and noticed that at higher F numbers, you see dust more, uh, you, you see it better than you do in lower apertures. It's basically for the same reason, in that larger apertures, the light comes in at a greater angle versus the, large, versus the smaller apertures or the higher F numbers, where light comes in a bit straighter. And so if you have any dust on the, on the sensor somewhere, then the straight light is going to cause a shadow onto the sensor right underneath it, whereas these, these sharper angles just are not going to uh, cause so much of, of the shadow. Now, um, there is something that, uh, that we do have to watch out for as well, and that is as you make this aperture smaller and smaller and smaller, we actually have this other uh, physical effect that happens to light called diffraction, and it can actually make things a little bit softer. So even though you can make the aperture so small that pretty much everything is in focus, um, you have this, this idea of diffraction that, can actually dis that disperses the light in such a way that it becomes... Um, uh, blurry, and it doesn't look in focus. Okay, but um, using depth of field, you can, of course, get these effects that you want. So you can alter the amount of background blur that you want by having a lower F number. And so the lower F number, again, uh, causes these stronger angles of light, which means that uh, it's, it's, a not, it, it, it's a lower range for, for us to fit that light within the circle of confusion, and therefore we have less of a depth of field, or we have less of a depth of focus and a longer depth of field. Um, but we can, um, but one of the things that lenses can do uh, in terms of the background blur uh, is, well, no, let me rephrase that. So uh, other than just affecting the amount of background blur that we have, the lens that you are using can also affect the quality of the background blur as well. And this is something that uh, as you get to, be, uh, to purchase more expensive lenses, you will start to notice that the background blur looks a little bit different. Maybe it looks a little bit smoother than in some of these less expensive lenses. And there's a very good reason for this. So if we take a look at this image here, for example, you'll notice that we have some lights or some uh, basically just reflections, really, that are slightly out of focus. But if you look very closely at this one, for example, it's actually not perfectly round. It actually has a bit of a geometric shape to it. So if we zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, you notice that hopefully it's, it's more obvious now that it is not a perfect circle, and in fact, it's more hexagonal. We have six sides to this particular uh, out of focus region. And the reason for that is the aperture itself. Now, if you remember, when I passed around the camera and you pushed that button and you saw the aperture fold down, it was, it was basically like these, um, these metal leaves that, that collapsed down and, and made a smaller hole. And sometimes, some lenses don't, have, don't cause an aperture that's perfectly circular. They will actually have like six leaves, for example, that collapse down and actually make 
a hexagon. And because all of the light comes through that aperture, and uh, even if it's out of focus, like say here, for example, you will actually see the geometric shape that's created by the aperture in out of focus areas. And so you can get some really, really strange out of focus effects, um, or what we call bokeh, which is basically the quality of the uh, out of focus blur, by using lenses that have different properties. So a typical camera lens, you would see something like this. And actually, now that I've pointed this out to you, um, if you, if you go home and you watch TV tonight, you will probably start to notice some of these things a little bit more. And it's going to bother you to no end when these uh, TV shows start using lenses where their out of focus blur causes these, these very polygonal areas like hexagons or pentagons or worse squares or triangles. I don't know. I don't think you'll see anything like that. But it's really going to bother you. And you will start to notice when they're using higher quality lenses that can actually have circles that are you know, in the background blur. Now, you can actually get some really funky stuff if you use lenses that are not typical camera lenses. So um, just in, as an example, I connected my camera a long time ago to a friend's telescope. Uh, and we calculated that the end focal length was about uh, 32, or no, it was 2,000 millimeters. So it's, it's you know, very long focal length. And um, just to give you an idea, this was at, when I was living in, in the dorms at MIT, which was uh, on, on the Cambridge side of the river. And we took it outside and set it up. And then we pointed it towards the Pru. And we wanted to see just how much we would be able to, to view. And that's this image here. And in the full image, it's actually uncropped. It's just resized. In the full image, you can actually read the exit signs within it. And the Pru is a quarter mile away. Or is it a quarter mile? No, it must be a mile and a quarter away, something like that. It's really far away. And you can see a lot of stuff. But because this was a schmidt cassid Cassegarian telescope, that means that it's a reflector, which means that the light comes in, there's a mirror in the back, then there's a smaller mirror in front where the light comes up where you can view it. There is a mirror right in the middle of the image. And so in the out of focus images, you actually get this donut effect. You get this weird out of focus shape that is really distracting and, and is not something that I think I would consider acceptable in a, in a typical image if I was just using it in, in my day-to-day -day images. And in fact, um, if you are purchasing a camera or if you are purchasing a lens and you see a very long lens, like 500 millimeters or 600 millimeters or something like that, and it's dirt cheap and it looks super small, it's most likely a mirror lens, a lens that's going to give you something like this because it, it folds the light by having a mirror in the, in the front and in the back uh, of the lens to you know, basically reflect the light and make the, the focal length longer. And that really reduces the, the cost of these lenses, but it also gives you, not, it gives you weird effects like this. And also, the, the aperture is, is really, really small uh, because these lenses are small, so you lose the ability to autofocus, and it's, oh, it's just a nightmare. So don't even bother wasting your money on these, these, uh, on these um, novelty mirror lenses because it's not really going to be much fun, except for something you know, kind of sketchy like this, where you're trying to take the photo of, of a, a very, very far away building. Now, um, the number of, of OK, so to go off the standard, the number of blades that exist in the, to form the aperture actually make a big difference to the bokeh. But there is a lot of other stuff that goes into bokeh as well. So, um, and, and there's, some, there's a, quite a few people that, that are very, very stringent about how their out of focus um, dots essentially look. And they look at not only how circular it is, but also how uniform it is, if, if there's any sort of ripplings of color. So if there's any hint of, let's say, a donut shape, so you know, nothing like this, but even just you know, maybe there's like a little bit of a halo or something like that, all of this stuff falls into this very broad term of bokeh. And it's not the quantity of background blur. That's not what we're referring to. We're referring to the quality of the background blur. And um, there was this, let's see, I hope this website still works. But there was this one guy who basically did a bokeh test on a number of, um, let's see, on a number of lenses. And he explains it actually pretty well. And I'll, I'll put this online. But uh, he goes through quite a bit of stuff. But uh, he also does a very good job of showing you 
what is good and what is bad bokeh. So for example, here we have relatively good bokeh because it's, it's circular and it's uniform, whereas here we have that halo problem that I was talking about. And this can contribute to uh, having a, a, a background blur that's, um, you know, rather than being smooth and, and sort of, and contributes to the look of the image, it could be sort of harsh in some way, and just in this sort of indescribable way, harsh and, and distracting to the final image. And so uh, whether you like it or not, this stuff does affect um, the, the end result of the image, but it doesn't mean that you should you know, dump all of your inexpensive lenses and, and go for the most expensive things out there. This is just something that you should be aware of and, and something that um, people do notice. In fact, one of the things that bothers me recently is um, that I, I was at a hotel in, in, in New York, a Marriott actually, and they, they seem to be catching this, this sort of um, postmodern art thing where they have some photos up that, you know, that's used to decorate the place, but the photos are strictly out of focus. It's just like some street lights that somebody doesn't know, you know, he doesn't know how to operate his camera, and so he, he takes a picture and it's completely out of focus, and it's basically like red light and a green light and like a blue light that's completely out of focus. And it bothers me that it was, oh, the book, it was terrible. Like that's the whole point of the image was this background blur, but it was, it was like spotty and it just, it just looked horrible. It was hexagonal and oh, no way. <laughs> oh, all right, anyways. Um, so yeah, so hopefully now that will bother you as much as it bothers me so I don't have to be alone in this. Now, going the other end, if you want to eliminate background blur entirely, we actually have this concept called the hyperfocal distance. So whereas before uh, you knew that the best way to eliminate background blur was just to have an F number that was the largest you could possibly do without reaching into the, um, you know, without reaching into the problems of diffraction, you can actually use something called the hyperfocal distance to try to get even more uh, in, di uh, in focus. And basically, you don't need a fancy camera to do this. You just need a camera that can, um, where you can set the aperture and you are able to focus on something of, of your design or something that you want to focus on. Excuse me. And what this allows you to do is to take uh, a photo of everything from, let's say, one half, or it's not, let's say, it's, it is exactly one half the distance of whatever it is you focused on all the way to infinity. So there is some point, there is some exact point for your exact camera and lens and F number configuration where you can dictate this, this point that is exactly so many feet away. So in this camera, let's just say it's right here. If you focus on, on me at this point, everything from half the distance from me to the camera all the way to infinity will be in focus. And there's a couple of ways that we can figure out what that distance is for your particular camera. I'm showing you the scary way first, and then I'll show you the easier way. But there is, of course, an equation for this. So if we want to figure out the hyperfocal distance, h, we just take the focal length, square it, divide it by the f number, and divide it by the minimum circle of confusion diameter. Remember that circle of confusion? I hope you're not confused yet, because you know, it's, it's reared its ugly head yet again. So if you know these values, uh, the focal length, which you should be able to determine based on uh, you know, usually there's a little zoom range on the camera when you're zooming in or out, or you can even look on the on the the front of the camera if you have a compact digital camera, for example, and you just know, let's say, the widest focal length and the the longest tele uh, the longest focal length, then you will be able to set it to one of those, for example, and know that focal length. Then you can figure out the f number, which you should know because you'll be setting it. And the minimum circle of confusion diameter you can look up online. There's a couple of, of nice tools that allow you to do this. And in fact, um, the easy way to do this, frankly, is not to use that equation, but instead to go to um, this website called dofmaster.com. And here they have uh, nice calculators and tutorials and even iPhone apps and printable graphs, all sorts of stuff. Uh, you can just pick your poison, figure out which one works best for you, set all of these things yourself in, in their fancy little app or in their complex little graph and be able to figure out exactly what the hyperfocal distance is. Um, now, remember that when you 
calculate the hyperfocal distance, it's going to be some number like, let's say, in feet, for example. And so you will try to focus on something that's that many feet away. And when you do that, you will achieve this hyperfocal distance. You will get everything from half the distance all the way to infinity in focus. You just get that sort of for free by using this calculation and for focusing in and for focusing on something at that particular distance. Now, if you happen to have an old school camera uh, with an old school lens, I guess, rather than an old school camera, and you have this sort of, um, this sort of aperture and, and focal length window on your lens, then this, this will help you out a lot because you can actually figure out what the hyperfocal distance is um, just by looking at it, basically. And so in this old example, we have a lens where um, you are focusing in on something and then it tells you, you via this graph up top how far away that object is. And so it tells it to you in, in uh, not only feet but also in meters. Now when you set the F number, you'll notice that it's color coded. So for example, F16 is green. And so if you, or rather uh, cyan, this sort of light blue. Um, and so if you set it to F16, then what you can do is look at this graph and you will see everywhere from this light blue line all the way to this light blue line will be in focus on that camera. So you can set it to whatever is in focus. It will, it will be in that range that is in focus. Now, if you set the very uh, leftmost part of this, of this range in, at the infinity point, you are automatically setting the hyperfocal distance because you will notice that you are getting everything from half of your focal distance uh, or half of your focus distance of about I don't know, like five and a half or so, five, you know, almost, you know, uh, five and a quarter, I guess, all the way to about, um, you know, 2.75 or something like that. You're getting from half of that distance all the way to infinity, and so you're able to maximize the focal range, or rather the, the, the amount uh, of objects that are in focus in your particular image. Now, this is definitely the easiest way to go about calculating it, but unfortunately, we don't have windows like this anymore because we, don't, we just don't have um, the need to know this sort of data in a very analog way. And in fact, if you have a camera or if you have a lens that's expensive enough, to, expensive enough to even have a focus distance window, it will typically be oversimplified like this, where you just have one line that indicates the focus distance and that's it. You don't get any of the other information. So unfortunately, um, we have to use these more complicated ways of, of calculating and using the hyperfocal distance. So again, go to dofmaster.com and you, you'll be able to solve this um, pretty easily. Or if you use this very fancy equation, um, you will be able to accomplish the same thing. Now moving on, um, there's a few other things about optics that are very in interesting and important to us. And, and that is uh, this somewhat recent, though not very, uh, technical innovation of image stabilization. And that is more specifically optical image stabilization. And so what this tries to do is there's something inside, there's like a glass element inside of the lens that's attached to a circuit board. And this circuit board detects when there's movement that's occurring to it. And uh, it tries to counteract that movement by moving this glass element to basically just counteract the movement that, that exists within your hands. And so what this can do is stabilize motion blur that happens as you try to hold a camera very, very still and try to take a photo. So as you can see from this example here, if we have IS off in, in the top image, um, it's somewhat blurry because we use too slow of a shutter speed perhaps to be able to capture everything that uh, in, in sharp focus. But if we turn on image stabilization, then we can stabilize everything and it looks to be somewhat sharp. Now, um, modern image stabilization techniques or technologies can generally give you about what they, what they refer to as three to four stops of stabilization. What that means is that whereas before, if you were only able to hold uh, a lens at a particular focal length, um, let's, so if you remember that, uh, that rule that I gave you where I said, okay, if you have a 200 millimeter lens, that means that you can hand hold that image sharp at about one two hundredth of a second. Well. That means if you get three to four stops additional stabilization, that means that you can go three to four stops slower than that. So that's one hundredth of a second to fiftieth of a second to twenty-fifth of a second. That's three stops to even maybe about thirteenth, one thirteenth of a second. So now whereas before you were only able to handhold it at about two hundredths of a second, 
you now can do it at a much slower speed to stabilize the image. Now, one of the things that's really important to realize about this is that it doesn't stop motion. It only stops your motion. Okay? So <clears throat> if there is somebody that's moving in the image, so if you know there's somebody over here and they're dancing and they're you're trying to take a photo of them, and you turn on image stabilization, you're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna be able to stop time with this. It's not going to happen. You will be able you only stabilize what's happening when you're hand holding that particular image. If there is somebody moving, realize that we've gone from one two hundredth of a second, which seems to have reasonable stopping power in terms of motion blur. We've gone down to about one thirteenth of a second. You can see that we're going to get a lot more motion blur from objects that are in the scene versus us being able to hold it. There's a very big difference here. And so people are always, you know, people love to say, oh, I can have a really slow lens. I can have like f5.6, f8, and it really doesn't matter because I have IS to make up for it. You really don't. It does not make up for that. It only makes up for your inability to hold the camera very, very stable. And that says nothing about you because it happens to all of us. It, you know, it's very hard to hold these things stable, but you just lose, you're still losing that light. So keep in mind that while IS is, is a very nice technology, it doesn't replace the larger apertures that we get in, in, in these other lenses. Okay, so just to give you a, a more you know, uh, diagram, uh, a, a better look at this using a diagram, uh, what happens when in image stabilization is that if we are moving this lens and, and it's sort of moving up and down over here, uh, then what we are trying to do usually in the lens is counteract that by moving a glass element up and down or, or in some other way. And in fact, there's new image stabilization tech, uh, technology that, uh, that uh, Canon just announced where it can also fix rotational problems as well. So if you, I don't even know when this would happen, but if you're rotating it very slightly, for example, it can try to fix that, which might be able to, uh, even have better stopping power. Now, realize that there's two forms of image stabilization. There's in-lens image stabilization, uh, which is, is the case with uh, Canon and Nikon cameras. And there's also in-camera stabilization, which you usually get, I think, with Sony cameras. And so uh, with the latter form, you're not moving one of the, the lens pieces or one of the lens elements to try to counteract it. You're actually moving the sensor itself. And now, you, you can say that this seems like a, a, it has quite a few advantages. For example, every lens that you put on your camera will therefore have image stabilization because it doesn't matter um, what kind of, it, the lens doesn't have to have IS in it. If you have a camera body that has IS, you'll be able to counteract that motion. So therefore it might be a bit cheaper because you're only paying for that technology once. And that's, those are both very, very valid um, uh, reasons to, pick a system that has image stabilization in the camera body versus in the lens. Um, but I would say that it really depends. So some, I, I, so I, don't, uh, I think that um, by having image stabilization in the lens, the engineers can tune the stabilization to that particular lens um, and be able to adjust for the motions that can exist within that lens better than they can if you're always adjusting motion that exists within the camera. And to put this another way, you can imagine that if you, have, um, if you have a very, very long lens, for example, and you are trying to counteract its motion by moving the sensor, it may not be as effective as it would be, for example, on the opposite end with a, long, with a wider focal length. So while it may, um, while it may give you some uh, benefits, in, you know, well, it will give you the benefits of being less expensive and also being omnipresent in basically all of your lenses that you put on there, it's not going to perhaps be as effective as these in-lens systems. So you have to, again, pick your poison. You can have a more expensive system and have you know, the best quality available by having them all in the, the camera, or you can have a, a less expensive system that maybe doesn't work as well and put it on the sensor. But there's another reason why you might want to have image stabilization in the lens itself. And that is that light, remember, if you follow the path of light as it enters your eye, it goes into the lens, bounces off the mirror before it goes into the viewfinder. So that means that if you have image stabilization in your lens, you will be able to see the image stabilization as it's happening uh, as, as you are using the camera. And if you've never used an image stabilized um, uh, 
camera before, or rather an image stabilized lens, it's, it's actually something that's really neat to be able to do because you're holding it and it's obviously like shaking a little bit and then when you turn on the IS, it just all of a sudden becomes really smooth and really sharp and it's really neat uh, and it's a really neat way of being able to help you um, remove that stabilization out of your uh, out of your viewfinder and get you to focus on the image itself. Um, so that's certainly one, one other way that this can be um, helpful. Now another thing to keep in mind is that um, using a tripod might be detrimental to some image stabilization. So if you have already stabilized the camera enough, you may want to turn IS off because sometimes it will still try to correct for motions that don't exist and you will sometimes get this really weird streaking of light that exists. In fact, I accidentally left IS on on, on this camera when I was taking photos, if you remember, from that uh, very compressed El Paso photo. Uh, and it was a little bit uh, it was a little bit later and it was a little bit darker and I left IS on and it was just a complete streaky mess. All the lights had been blurred out of um, uh, to oblivion because they because I left IS on. So you might need to turn that off. Now some uh, some image stabilization systems also have different modes available to you. So for example, um, if you wanted to take a photo that is of uh, of uh, motorsports, for example, where you remember that um, there was that photo of, of the car where the car itself was in focus but everything else was blurry. Now you can imagine that at, when you're taking a photo like that, you're panning the camera along with the, um, along with the, um, the car itself. And you, if you have IS on, you may not want it to operate on the horizontal axis because it might try to fight you, so to speak, as you move the camera left to right might try to correct for that and you could get some weird effects. So some cameras, or rather some lenses, have additional modes that allow you to turn uh, IS on on certain axes only so that you can say um, enable it only on the vertical axis so that you can get very nice horizontal pans like that. Or you could have both axes and, and be able to really stabilize um, image in that way. Now image stabilization is really neat, but remember that I said, like I said, that it's, it's really not uh, a good replacement for very large aperture lenses. It's, it's definitely a good complement to it, um, but it's certainly not very good as, as a replacement for it. Um, now, if we continue talking about some, uh, uh, some optical technology, you'll, you'll notice that I mentioned tilt-shift lenses before. Now, one of the things, I don't want to talk a lot about them um, because they're, I, I don't think many of you will actually ever use tilt shift lenses and, and it's because of how expensive they are, but you can have some neat effects with them. You can actually dramatically change the way uh, that the depth of field can occur in a particular image. So this image looks like a model, but it is actually real, it's actually a real scene. It is actually of a highway with cars on it, but with using a tilt shift lens, they've been able to exaggerate um, the depth of field so much that it makes it look like a macro shot. It makes it look like it's only a shot of some models. And um, if you use, for example, the shift portion of the lens, what you can do is eliminate some of these, these perspective problems, these perspective converging lines that can occur, especially with architectural photography. If you're an architectural photographer, you will, you will have to um, probably consider using one of these lenses because of, of how useful they are for that. And so. It doesn't make a lot of sense, at least initially, why you would use shift and not the tilt portion to fix this. But rest assured that it, this is actually what you want. You want to use the shift portion to be able, it, you're essentially shifting the lens up and that way you're able to get it uh, to be a bit straighter. You're altering where the, the horizon is on that particular image. And what shift is used for, um, is, is to, or rather what tilt is used for, is to actually tilt the focal plane against the, uh, the, the, um, against the lens plane, and you can alter not only its depth of field, but, uh, well, you will alter its depth of field. So you can either get a lot in focus, uh, so you could, uh, I mean, besides the hyperfocal distance, you could even get, even with a very low F number, a lot, a lot in focus. So this is very good also for landscape photography. Or you could go the other route as well and make it look like, um, like what you're taking photos of are models. Now, um, very quickly, 
I did want to address filters as well. And so one of the things that uh, you'll remember is that the filter size symbol is, looks similar to the, uh, the focal plane symbol. It's just tilted a little bit. And so um, there are some filters that are very, very useful to us. So for example, neutral density filters. Now what this filter will do when you put it on top of your, or on the front of your lens, is it essentially acts as sunglasses for your particular camera. And what it does is, as sunglasses, let's see, do I even have it here? Um, what it does is it just makes the scene darker. And what that means is that you can have a slower shutter speed for a higher amount of light. So here's a neutral density filter, for example, and it just looks darker. And that's all it really does, is it just makes the scene darker so you could have longer shutter speeds available to you so that you could get, for example, a uh, motion blur within an image that's you know, at, at the brightest point of day. Uh, and this, this, this is helpful even if uh, you have the lowest ISO possible and the highest F number possible and it's, you're still getting a really, really fast shutter speed, you can use a neutral density filter to try to help combat that. So that's if you want motion blur in your, um, in your scene at all. And so typically uh, you, they come available in filter factors. This one is called an ND4, for example, and that means that I'm multiplying my, or I'm dividing my shutter speed by four. I'm making it four times slower. And in retrospect, um, I should have bought a higher power because the only time that I really need it is when I want really long shutter speeds. I think ND8 or, or even higher, if, if possible, um, would have been even better to get. Um, okay. Now there are other filters available as well. So there's something called a, a polarizer filter as well. Uh, and specifically a circular polarizer. So there's linear polarizer and circular polarizer. Do not get anything but a circular polarizer if you're going to get one. Um, linear polarizers can have problems with autofocus in some cameras, and it's just not something that you want to have to deal with. Most of these filters now are circular polarizer, but you still want to be sure that you're getting the, uh, the correct one. You don't want to get linear. Now, what if, you, if you have polarizer sunglasses, for example, you may know what this effect does. It actually will increase or alter the amount of contrast within the scene. And in fact, if we take a look at this photo, which is kind of boring, and we take a look at this next photo, this is with the polarizer, you see that it has changed the, the appearance of the colors. It has changed the contrast within the scene without doing anything, not waiting for the light to change without doing anything other than just attaching the polarizer. So just going back and forth, you can probably see the difference. No polarizer and polarizer. Now one of the other things that polarizing filters will do is alter the way um, that you view reflections. And in particular, if you have a very heavily reflected region, you can use a circular polarizer to actually remove those reflections and be able to see something underneath it. So this is useful in water or, for example, glass. If you're trying to take a um, maybe an automotive photo, for example, and you want to try to eliminate as many reflections as you can off of the windshield or off of the side window, you can use a circular polarizer and you twist it. You basically twist it until you get um, the exact point that allows a certain amount of light in uh, and the reflected light out. And the reason that this works is that when light reflects off of something, it becomes polarized in a, in a particular direction. By using a polarizer, you're able to just eliminate some of those polarized um, regions of light. And so there's other filters available as well, like a haze UV filter. Um, and I'm just going to say it, I think they're useless. I don't think you need to buy them. The reason for that is that a lot of people like to use them for protection for their, for their, uh, for their investments. If they buy a very expensive lens, they want to put just some piece of filter, or some piece of glass in front so that you can protect the front element from dings or from cracks or from something like that. But there's two major downsides to this. The first is, well, three, I guess. The first is cost. You have to spend money to buy a good filter. And uh, tangentially, if you're going to buy a filter, you should buy one that's multi-coated because it's, it's really silly. If you buy a really cheap filter and you have a really expensive lens and you put something that's going to reflect a lot of light or do a very, you know, a lot of disservice to, to your lens, so you should buy a multi-coated uh, lens for your or rather multi-coated filter for your expensive lenses. Okay, so 
With haze UV filters, first you have the cost that you have to pay for. Next, anything that you put in front of your lens is going to decrease the amount of light entering into it. No matter how clear the glass is, I don't care how clear it is, you're decreasing the amount of light that's entering into it. You know that glass is somewhat reflective. Some of the light is being bounced back. Some of it is just not being transmitted through. So you're losing some light available to you whenever you put it on. The third thing is that as, as a protection scheme, I think, that's, I think that's a bunch of crap, frankly. And let me show you what I mean by that. So let's say that we have a lens and it looks good, okay? And we take a photo that looks like this. It's a pretty clear photo, it looks pretty good. Now, um, let's say that we start dirtying the lens a little bit. So we put a little bit of dust in front uh, and um, let's see, what's wrong with this? I think they just put a little bit of dust. It's kind of hard to see right here. There's some dust and some other stuff. Then they take another photo and you see that there's nothing wrong with the photo. Okay, now um, what they do is they put pieces of masking tape in front of the lens and they try to actually mask some of the light that's entering into it. All right, well, you know what? Still looks the same, you can't tell. All right, so now let's go a little bit stronger and let's t actually crack the lens, okay? <laughs> Drop the lens, break it completely, take a photo. It looks like this. Now, for the most part, this is kind of still usable. If you're in a bind and you can't replace the lens, it still works. And this, it's not just this website. You can Google around. You will find so many examples of this happening that it's, I mean, I just, I don't think it's worth it. So don't waste your money. Don't waste your time on these haze UV filters. Just go for it. And, uh, and, and if you're careful, you can actually continue taking good photos. And in fact, if you take a look at some of my lenses in the front, they're, I mean, they're pretty well used. They have, you know, fingerprints, they have dust on them. And they frankly work the way that they always did. What's more important, you should keep the back of the lens as clean as you possibly can. That is what matters. The front of the lens really doesn't. But with all of that said, thank you for coming and we will see you in two weeks. I think next week we actually have uh, a, a holiday. So in two weeks, we will see you back here.